I greet you with Jesus joy this afternoon. Certainly it's a pleasure and a privilege to once again be able to be in the house of the Lord. Before I begin my dialogue, I would like to make some expressions of gratitude uh, to my friend uh, uh, Cameron Cox. Um, Cam, I do appreciate your sacrifice and your uh, willingness to meet us anywhere, anytime, uh, so that we can do these lessons. Uh, I certainly appreciate you, and I hope that those of you who are watching appreciate the sacrifice that this gentleman makes uh, to get the word out. Our lesson this week is entitled, Called in Authority, and it's found in, Luke, in Mark's Gospel, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And I want to begin our dialogue today by uh, asking a question. And it may seem like a question with an obvious answer, but I'll ask it anyway because I think that it's an important question. The question is this, what is the most distinctive benefit that Christianity has to offer the world? Now, there's a great benefit uh, that the Christian gospel offer, and that benefit transcends all other benefits because it addresses man's greatest need. But what is man's greatest need? Well, I do appreciate your curiosity, and I think that I can answer that question. Simply put, man's greatest need is to escape the wrath of God that will be poured out on sinners eternally in hell. Only the Christian gospel offers the benefit that meets that need. Only through the Christian gospel can anyone escape the wrath of God that will be poured out on sinners eternally in hell. Now, a second question that comes as a follow-up to that one is, what is it that sends people to hell? And again, I, I appreciate your curiosity. Uh, someone has said that it would be sin that sends people to hell. But it's not sin alone that sends people to hell. It's unforgiven sin that sends people to hell. Hell is occupied by people whose sins have never been and will never be forgiven. Heaven, on the other hand, is occupied by people whose sins have all been forgiven. And so the greatest benefit of Christianity, then, is the provision of complete forgiveness of sin. Now, God uniquely presents himself in Scripture as a God who is willing and is able to forgive sin. He seeks to save sinners from his own wrath. That is the message of the Christian gospel. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> now, that's absolutely amazing when you think about it, because there's nothing more offensive to God than sin, because he's an absolute holy God. And yet, he finds glory in the forgiveness of sinners. You wonder, how can he do that? Well, again, I appreciate your curiosity. He can do that because his justice has been satisfied in the death of Jesus Christ. Jesus came as a substitute for the sinner. And this is the message of the Christian gospel, that Jesus came to forgive sinners. And scripture is very clear that God is the one who is offended, and God is the only one who can forgive sin. He has, and he will, and he will continue to forgive sin. Our lesson text today is a story about forgiveness. <coughs> Excuse me. Let me read it to you. If you'll listen with your ears, but look with your eyes. Beginning at verse 1, Mark's Gospel, chapter 2. And it reads, And again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately many gathered, so that there was no longer room to receive him, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. Then they came to him bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sin but God alone? But immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, 
Why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic? Your sins are forgiven or to say, arise, take of your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, take up your bed and go to your house. And immediately, underline that, immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went out in the presence of them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. So reads our lesson text. Our lesson is really a, lesson, a story about forgiveness. And so this is a story that's full of people. You have the curious crowd. There's the paralytic and his four friends. There's the Savior. And there are the religious leaders, the scribes. Now, every story uh, can be broken into three parts. You have the setting, you have action, and then you have reaction. And as you go through the stories in the record of the life of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that's kind of how it is. And as we go through this story, I invite you to uh, examine yourself and see if you can identify with the any of the characters in this story. It begins by saying, and again he entered into Capernaum. Now that phrase would indicate that Jesus had been somewhere else doing something else for a period of time. And if you'll go back to chapter 1, about verse 45, in the middle of that verse it says, he could not enter a city. Uh, and this was because he had healed a man from leprosy, and he had told the man not to say anything, uh, but to go to Jerusalem and show himself to the priest. But this man had to be a brother because he told everybody that would listen. And so everywhere that Jesus went, he healed people. And he was certainly willing to heal, but what was more important to him uh, was stated back in verse 38 in chapter 1 when it says, He said to him, them, talking to his disciple, let us go somewhere else uh, to towns nearby. Here it is, so that I may preach there also, for that is what I came for. And so Jesus went to the synagogues throughout Galilee, preaching the gospel of salvation, repentance, and faith in God's grace and forgiveness, and he cast out many demons. Now, he comes back to his home base, as it were, in Capernaum, uh, and most Bible scholars believe that his, he stayed at the home of Andrew and Simon Peter. But in our text, it says there in verse 2, many gathered together there, insomuch that there was no room to receive them. Now, we need to understand something at this point. And this is going to be something that's true throughout Jesus' ministry. Big crowds were not a measure of his ministry success or spiritual success. Never does Mark anywhere in his gospel say that the crowds were coming to Jesus in repentance and faith. They were curious, but they were indifferent. They were passive. They were uncommitted. They wanted the healing. Yes, they did. They wanted the food, for sure. But they were not seeking anything spiritual from Jesus. And so we have the curious crowds. But if you'll drop down to verse 6 in our text, you'll find there that there were also some scribes in the crowd. And Luke tells us in his account that there were also some Pharisees. Now, these were the teachers and the theologians of the time, the religious people. They're in the crowd also, and they're there with a different agenda. They're really there to try and trap Jesus. And so this is the setting. You have the curious crowd and the scribes, but then starting in verse 3, we see the action. Let me read it for you. Verse 3, it says, Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. And so here we're introduced to the paralytic and his four friends. And they're coming for healing. 
and his friends, the paralytic man, his friends, because of the curious crowd, uh, they couldn't get him in, so they began removing the roof above Jesus to get the man in. Now, that had to be a shocking event, to say nothing of a very disturbing event. If you were teaching, you'd like to have as few distractions as possible, right? But just imagine, Jesus is there, he's teaching and he's preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and then all of a sudden, parts of the roof start falling in, some of it perhaps falling on him. The people are looking up, and there is a serious distraction. But these men are so determined to get this guy through, the hole keeps getting bigger and bigger, and finally they're able to lower the man down right in front of Jesus. Let's stop right there. Now, we're not told much about these five men, but we know this one thing about them. They believed that Jesus could heal. Uh, and we know this because of verse 5. It says, Jesus seeing their faith. They say nothing, or at least nothing is recorded. They didn't even apologize for creating such a disturbance. They could have at least said, excuse us, Jesus, uh, we hate to interrupt your message. Uh, but because of their action, Jesus saw in the man a faith that was not visible to everybody else. We come now to the highlight of the story. It says, Jesus, seeing his faith, says to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, what kind of faith did Jesus see in this man? Well, I'm glad you asked because I really want to tell you. It was not human faith, but spiritual faith. Jesus didn't need anybody to tell him what was in the heart of the paralytic. He knew what was in his heart. And in this man's heart, Jesus saw the faith that saves. Now, I want you to see something here. This is the first mention of faith in Mark's gospel. Mark's gospel is known as the action gospel. And these men's faith is linked to action. When it says Jesus seeing their faith, what that really means is he can see that they had faith in his healing ability because of what they did. Now, they had the kind of faith that you could see. Faith is always linked to action. James put it this way. He said, I'll show you my faith by my works, by what I do, because first, faith without works is dead faith. Faith acts. Faith overcomes. Faith pursues. And so <clears throat> when Jesus says, uh, what Jesus says in reaction to this demonstration of faith is really surprising. Now, <clears throat> I would have thought that he would have said something like, Son, be healed. Instead, Jesus said what got to the very heart of, the most, of what most of the curious crowd assumed to be true about illness. The Old Testament frequently assumes a direct connection between sin and sickness. This, this belief persisted even into Jesus' day, uh, and it was what led the disciples to ask Jesus in John chapter 9, verse 2, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? Every issue of humanity's physical frailty can be traced in a general sense to the sin of Adam and Eve. But that doesn't, hear me good, but that doesn't mean that every illness is traceable to a specific sin. Jesus did not engage in a discussion of why the man was paralyzed. He recognized that the man's greater need was to be forgiven his sins. Jesus knew what the paralytic man really wanted. Now, he wanted healing, of course. But more than that, this man wanted forgiveness. So we've seen the setting curious crowd and the scribes. We've seen the action, the faith of the paralytic and his friends, and Jesus forgiving his sins. Now we come to the reaction. There in verse, starting in verse 6, the B portion of that verse, and then verse 7. 
It says, and reasoning in their hearts, why does this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? Now, Mark does not directly describe the reaction of the paralyzed man, nor his friends, nor of the crowd. He records the unspoken skepticism of the scribes. Now, the scribes were well aware that no one can forgive sins but God alone. But Jesus spoke as though he had the same power to forgive sins as God. And the scribes concluded that Jesus was speaking blasphemies, and the penalty for blasphemy was being put to death by stoning. Now, the whole point of the story is this. Either Jesus is a blasphemer or Jesus is God. There's no middle ground. He's either the one who can forgive sin or he's not. And if he can forgive sin, he's God. If not, he's a blasphemer. There's no middle ground here. And when Jesus says, why are you reasoning about these things in your heart? That was firsthand proof that he was not a blasphemer. Now, Jesus read their minds. They questioned as to whether Jesus is a blasphemer, but they should have recognized at this point that it was not because blasphemers don't know what people are thinking. Then his second action, seen in verse 9, when he says, which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, pick up your pallet and walk, how do you prove that someone's sin has been forgiven? You can't. It's not verifiable. But if you say, pick up your pallet and walk, and then it happens, then you have proven that you have the power and the authority to make it happen. <clears throat> and if the man gets up and walks, that proves that Jesus is not a blasphemer. He's God. And moreover, it validates the fact that Jesus could forgive sin because only God can do both. As Savior God, Jesus has the power to overrule the effects of sin. <clears throat> and by the way, Jesus delegated this power over the effects of sin to his disciples for a brief period of time. He gave them healing power and the ability to cast out demons but he never delegated to anybody the authority and the power to forgive sin. One last thing, and then we'll be done. <clears throat> Look at the reaction of the paralytic. Verse 12a, it says, And immediately he arose, took up the bed, went forth before them all. To put it simply, this man believed and this man obeyed. He didn't lay there and make excuses, saying, well, I've never walked before. I don't think I can do it. It says immediately he obeyed Jesus. He got up and he walked. Now, this story reminds us that just being in the curious crowd is not enough. Faith is verified by what we do, not what we say. And God alone can forgive sin. The story also reminds us of how much we need our fellow believers, our fellow brothers and sisters in the bodies of Christ, in the body of Christ. While we probably will never need anyone to carry us on a stretcher to church or to Wednesday night's prayer meeting, we do need to bear one another burdens. And in conclusion, as a result of our dialogue, I hope that it has been reaffirmed in your hearts that the most distinctive benefit of Christianity that Christianity has to offer the world is a way to meet man's greatest need, to show sinners a way to escape the wrath of God eternally, to receive forgiveness of sin. May God bless you and God keep you till we meet again. This is my prayer.